Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. The simple fact that you remember to come to an Alzheimer's talk shows that you don't have Alzheimer's. That's really good. Um, it's not really a funny thing, though, as the number six killer in America, it's, uh, and that's killer, not incidence. It's a serious disease. Alzheimer's disease is when you have both memory problems and cognition problems. It means you have trouble thinking as well as remembering. And Alzheimer's disease is serious dementia. So if you just forget your keys, that's not Alzheimer's disease. But it needs to be diagnosed usually by a neuropsychologist, and that takes you know, a couple hours and maybe an MRI, and then it's confirmed. And the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is, is really severe. In fact, it's really hard for people to take very understandably. I think we can almost agree that Alzheimer's disease is the scariest disease in the world. Uh, if you lose your legs, you're still you. Even if, you know, you get cancer, you're still you. But if you lose your mind, you're not you anymore. And all your experiences and who you are and what you are are lost. And, of course, it's really tough on the caregivers, too. So I've been developing a nutritional protocol for Alzheimer's disease. And the doctors that I talk to, they understand that this Alzheimer's Association quote, at this time, there is no treatment to delay, stop, or cure the progression of Alzheimer's disease. If you substitute the word drug, they're absolutely right. There are no drugs that slow or stop the degeneration of Alzheimer's disease. There's only a couple drugs used for it, and the doctors are very unhappy with that. Now, I'm happy that I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a nutritional biochemist. I only study how food affects health and don't deal with drugs directly. Although I work with a group of physicians, the Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, and there we have a study that we're starting, a clinical study, to show that this protocol will work. 15 different nutritional interventions all at once, and each one of them has already been shown to have a good effect on stopping the progression of Alzheimer's disease, perhaps even reversing it a little bit. The brain on the left is a healthy brain, and the brain on the right is an Alzheimer's brain. You notice it's a lot smaller, perhaps half the size. During the course of Alzheimer's disease, the brain cooks down to about half its size. Cooks really by free radical action, damaging the membranes and then destroying brain cells and connections between brain cells. This is what we'd like to avoid. I think that's why you're here, and that's why I'm here too. The lower picture, the ones with the colors, is a PET scan, and that shows glucose activity. The brain runs on glucose, so its ability to think more is illustrated by the yellow and red coloring. You can see in advanced Alzheimer's disease, there's very little activity left in the brain. It, not even enough for autonomic functions, and that's how people die from Alzheimer's disease. The brain can't control the body anymore either. Whoops, sorry, I double-clicked. There it is. This graph is from the Centers for Disease Control, and it shows the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. The red line shows from 1979 up to present, and you'll see that it's grown by 85 times in incidence. Alzheimer's disease is also forecast to grow not only in the developed world, but in the developing world hugely. Why is this? Have people changed, or has the diet changed? I think the diet has changed. And the diet is now changing in the developing world to match our wonderful diet here of fast food and, you know, <laughs> all the foods that aren't so healthy anymore, missing nutrients. Now, the word dementia is illustrated by this pie chart, and you can see that there's one section here that is strictly Alzheimer's disease. But Lewy bodies is Parkinson's disease, and a lot of Parkinson's disease also involves Alzheimer's disease. Now, we find that vascular dementia is when your arteries in your brain are as clogged up as the typical arteries are in a heart, then you get vascular dementia, lack of blood flow to the brain. And vascular dementia is very commonly associated with Alzheimer's disease. So in our clinical trial, we're going to try to reduce vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. So we're going to encompass this whole circle here. About three-quarters of dementia is either vascular or Alzheimer's related. 
There are a few other kinds of dementia that are a little more rare. Who's the culprit? That fuzzball you see over there, a labeled amyloid plaque, is something that is very much associated with Alzheimer's disease. These form in the brain starting perhaps 20, 30 years before Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed. So there's practically no one in this room who's too young to stop Alzheimer's now instead of waiting until you know, it's diagnosed or waiting until you're really old. We should all take precautions just like we do with heart disease and diabetes and all the other diseases. And they're not that hard. They're pretty reasonable. So these fuzzball plaques called amyloid plaque, they're formed between neurons, between brain cells. There's also another feature of Alzheimer's disease, tau tangles. You know how the neuron on the bottom here looks like a fried egg? Well, it is almost literally fried by free radical damage. And its connections get lost and then it dies. So you lose another brain cell if you have these tau tangles, also known as phosphorylated tau. Now, this is an interesting chart because it shows what I just mentioned, that the first line here is amyloid beta accumulation, this line. Now, MCI is mild cognitive impairment, and those are the people that we're going to take in as participants in our study. That means that it's beyond normal dementia, beyond normal aging, but before dementia. So this is an intermediate point. But you'll notice that once people are diagnosed with MCI, their amyloid plaque buildup is already quite high. And the tau-mediated damage, this green line, is also about half as high as it's going to go just at the onset of MCI. And by the time you get to dementia, it's really up there. So it's a great idea to start early with these things and not wait until the last minute. This is our team, and we have neuropsychologists, many neurologists. We have a team of five registered dietitians who are going to help with the dietary changes, actually going to call the participants every day for two weeks, do an one hour face-to-face -to, -face to try and get people to change their eating habits, which is very challenging. That's one of the reasons that modern medicine doesn't use nutritional protocols is because it's very difficult to get people to change. And of course, another reason is there's not much profit in it. So the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial is fully funded. It's operational right now. We're selecting participants and randomizing them. And November 3rd, we're going to you know, start the clock for the one hour, excuse me, one year study with a six month follow up. So here are some of the things that we're going to do. Provide folate and vitamin B12, two B vitamins. And what they do is they take a harmful blood chemical called homocysteine. Who's heard of homocysteine? this crowd. It's an educated crowd. Homocysteine is a nasty blood indicator of heart attack risk. It's also very much an indicator of Alzheimer's risk. How do you get rid of it? Get these two B vitamins and your body will transform the homocysteine into an incredibly useful chemical called SAM-E or S-adenosyl methionine. I'll call it SAM-E because it's easier to say. This SAM-E then has the amazing ability to go and quench the genes that create the enzymes that create those fuzzball amyloid plaques in your brain. This is epigenetic work that you have the genes and they're going to create the amyloid plaques, but not if they're quenched. So the SAM-E is able to methylate and quench these genes so they no longer express the beta and gamma secretase enzymes that make the amyloid plaques. We're also going to supply SAM-E as a supplement as well. So I wouldn't recommend to everyone to take SAM-E, but if you're experiencing memory problems, if you're diagnosed with MCI or Alzheimer's disease, that might be a good time to consider it. And I'll talk more about that as we go. Now, who's heard of advanced glycation end products? Okay, very much fewer hands. These nasty perverted proteins, polymerized and plasticized proteins, are caused by barbecuing, grilling, frying, browning, basically, of meats and fish. They're also formed in cheese when it's aged. Proteins lock onto sugars and form these advanced glycation end products, and they wind up in the amyloid plaque and shower your brain with 50 times the free radical damage that other ones do. So these can be changed dietarily, simply by not using those cooking techniques is one way. 
Of course, we're going to increase fruits, vegetables, and nuts to increase antioxidants. And uh, we're also giving supplementary antioxidants. We have a customized blend brain and body food that we're using in our trial. And this brain and body food will have many of the antioxidants that are going to sup supplement the diet. And we're going to see, we're going to test one group against another group to see if the supplements alone will work or the supplements with diet are going to work the best. My bet is supplements with diet are going to work the best. But this is science. We have to wait and see. It's never been done before. We're going to also supplement with, uh, a, let's see, the vitamin E and the scorbate are in the formula and coenzyme Q10, which is a, the only fat-soluble antioxidant made in the human body. It's also crucial for energy production as part of the electron transport chain. So we're supplying this also to the people in the trial. I'm really happy to say that we got all of the $75,000 worth of supplements donated by Life Extension Foundation. And then we're going to reduce animal fats. We're going to try to reduce animal fats in diets. It's not always easy um, to get people to do that um, because by lowering saturated fats, we're going to go for the American Heart Association target of below 7% of calories. And there's several reasons for this. I'll explain as we go on. Of course, vascular dementia is the big one. If we can stop the people from plugging up their brain arteries with saturated fat, then that will definitely help with vascular dementia. So we're going to do our best to get people to eat less saturated fat. And finally, there are a couple of medical plants that have been used and proven scientifically very thoroughly to help with Alzheimer's disease, to stop dementia in its tracks, even to reverse it to a certain extent, if it's early enough in the progression of the disease. So now it's time for a little science project. What you see here is a membrane of a brain cell. And in this membrane, we have certain enzymes. They're a little hard to see, but here's gamma secretase and here's beta secretase, this purple blob and this green blob. And this amyloid precursor protein is a transmembrane protein that when snipped off first by beta and then by gamma secretase, forms these beta amyloid peptides that clump together make fibrils, and turn into the plaque, the amyloid beta plaque that clogs up the brain in Alzheimer's disease. They're neurotoxic to begin with. They also give a place for the advanced glycation end products to lodge and damage the brain. Most of the damage is mediated by free radical damage to the delicate fatty membranes of the brain cells. So as I mentioned, SAMI is able to quench the production of beta and gamma secretase so that you don't produce more amyloid plaques. If we can, there's one other thing that quenches them, of the production of these two enzymes, and that's lower blood cholesterol. So if people are lowering their saturated fats below 7%, their blood cholesterol goes down fairly rapidly, within a week or two, and then they will have less amyloid beta forming because these two secretase enzymes will not be formed. The genes won't express them. We have a question. How low are you trying to get the cholesterol? Well, how low would I like to get it? Below 150 milligrams per deciliter. How low are we likely to get it? If we're very lucky, maybe below 180 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, it depends on how compliant people are. Um, you know, elders are perhaps a little stuck in their ways, and um, I'm not going to be an elder for another six months, so I can say, you know, <laughs> elders. Um, so it's hard to change habits, and that's why we're, we're, we've got all these registered dietitians committing, and the registered dietitian, all of us doctors, we're all working without pay to do this trial because we can't get drug company funding because it's not a drug. Okay, so this, I'll talk a little bit about elevated homocysteine. When you have high homocysteine, then what that does is it makes more beta and gamma secretase. If the homocysteine is transformed into SAMe with those two B vitamins, you remember which two those are? B12 and folate. Now, sometimes folate is called folic acid in the synthetic form when it's used for fortification of food or in supplements, but the folate form is much better uh, in food or in supplements. Not many supplements include the folate form. I certainly do. So we want to keep the homocysteine down. Two simple B vitamins, cheap, easy to get. B vitamins make a huge difference. So here's one study. Uh, 
this study's in the archives of neurology, and they looked at those people with, who already had Alzheimer's disease, and they were four times as likely to have elevated homocysteine and low vitamin B12 levels, three times as likely to have low folate levels. So it looks like those with Alzheimer's disease have too much homocysteine, not enough B12 and folate. Well, let's look before that. In this study, and this one's from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, patients before they had Alzheimer's disease who had high levels of homocysteine had four times the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So if you wanted four times the risk of Alzheimer's disease, you want to forget something really crucial in your life, then you would just want to not get any B12 or folate, and that would, that would help you achieve that goal. Probably not a good idea. This study is really interesting because cognitive scoring was dependent on normal values of folate and vitamin B12. Yes? Was there high levels of homocysteine? Well, if you, you know, if you get a blood analysis, they often include homocysteine because it's a cardiac risk factor. And you can look at the normal zone, and it'd be best to be at the low level. And depending on who you are and what age and sex you are, your normal levels would be a little bit different. So just look, look on there. The, the um, readout should tell you what low is. But by supplying sufficient vitamin B12 and folate, now folate's named after foliage, green leafy vegetables. So lots of green leafy vegetables are nutritionally excellent and also provide your folate. Vitamin B12 is best to take in a supplement. So they also looked at homocysteine and tau tangles. Now, tau tangles are the other signature feature of Alzheimer's disease. And they found that higher homocysteine levels in the brain were associated with the accumulation of tau tangles, which means destroyed connections between the brain cells and dead brain cells. So a good idea not to have that, those high levels of homocysteine. Easy to control. So from these studies, and many others just like them, we can see that vitamin B12 and folate, if you just get enough, can cut your risk of Alzheimer's disease down by one quarter. Pretty easy to do, pretty cheap. Uh, it would be nice if everyone did that. Do you, does everyone get enough folate? Well, I have this software called the Diet Doctor, and it's, I think it's a lot of fun. You put in what you ate in a day or what someone else ate in a day, and it analyzes the nutrition. And then you can see how much they got. I analyze the Atkins diet here, and this is how much folate the, uh, oh, this is an American diet. This isn't even an Atkins diet. This is how much folate they got on a typical American diet, and this is how much is needed as a bare minimum, as an RDA. So it's very common for diets not to have enough folate. Why? It's people aren't eating enough greens and beans, two common sources of folate, and two of the most nutritious foods on the planet. You can see from the chart that Popeye was definitely right. Folate in spinach is about the highest. Pinto beans are really good, sunflower seeds, even whole grains have folate in them. So those are some sources if you want to get it naturally. What about vitamin B12? Well, it's tough because the people who get the most vitamin B12 in their diets are the ones who show the most clinical deficiency of vitamin B12. That's because vitamin B12 is found in fiberless foods like meat and chicken. But these fiberless foods mess up digestion they're very challenging to the parietal cells in the stomach. The parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid, and they also produce the intrinsic factor, which is necessary to absorb your vitamin B12, cobalamin. So it turns out that everybody should probably supplement with vitamin B12. If you're getting none because you're plant-based, or if you're getting plenty because you're meat-based, probably a good idea to supplement with vitamin B12. Taking a look at some diets uh, analyzed with my diet doctor software, the red means not enough folate. So the standard American diet, the Atkins diet, the zone diet. Now this is a bad vegetarian diet, which I mean, bad's not a very good word to use, but it's got a lot of cheese, you know, eggs, white flour, macaroni and cheese, scrambled eggs, this kind of thing. And it is possible to have a vegetarian diet that's every bit as bad as a standard American diet. You really need to actually go plant-based to start getting the full benefits. And the South Beach diet was kind of low, too. Now, the McDougal heart attack diet and the Ornish diet had enough. Mediterranean diet had enough. And the, the vegan whole food and the vegan raw food, look at the vegan raw food numbers there, had plenty of folate. 
Lots of kale in those diets. Can you see that okay? Okay. Now, for those of you note takers, um, I do have a book on Alzheimer's disease on our table. And all of this stuff is in the book. And we have some videos that show me doing this presentation if you prefer a video. So you don't have to write everything down or memorize everything. It's like I say, there's 15 nutritional interventions all at once. Vitamin B12 was abundant in certain diets and zero in other diets. But in the abundant diet, they're eat, it's high because they're eating animal foods with no fiber. And that's hard on the intestines and uses a lot of hydrochloric acid, challenging the parietal cells, as I mentioned. So what about taking SAM-E by itself? Well, when folate and vitamin B12 levels are low, then less SAM-E is formed. And without enough SAM-E I mentioned, those enzymes will produce more amyloid plaque, killing off brain cells right and left. So we're going to use SAM-E also in it. And this, this study, um, which is in molecular and cellular neuroscience, talks about alterations in DNA methylation status with deregulation of the base and presilin. These are the two genes that we want to suppress. So this has been well documented that you can do it, either with SAMI or with folate and vitamin B12. In our study, we're going whole hog, SAMI and folate and vitamin B12. So we really want to stop people from developing dementia. SAMI also reduced tau tangles in another study in the Journal of Neuroscience. Lack of SAMI or excess of homocysteine increased the tau tangles, killing off brain cells. They looked in the cerebrospinal fluid to see if people with Alzheimer's disease had enough SAMI, and they didn't. It was low. So further confirming the association in between these things. Now, are there any caveats with SAMe? Well, there are. It's a prescription drug in some countries. In America, it's over the counter. I mean, you can get it anywhere from a health food store to Costco. Um, but if you take too much, you get too big of a smile, especially if you couple it with Prozac. So we, we have exclusion requirements for our study, and people who are already on Prozac or any other SSRI um, psychoactive drugs they're going to be excluded from the study because of the interaction between Sam E and this. And, you know, we don't want a too big of a smile. <laughs> Even St. John's work uh, can't be taken during our trial because of interactions with Sam E. Sam E is not only used for depression very widely, but also for osteoarthritis. In one study showing that it was as powerful as Celebrex, a very strong painkiller, in reducing the pain in joints in osteoarthritis. So it really has some good benefits, very well tolerated. Yes. Vitamin B12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Together would produce the SAMI in your system. And here it says that it shouldn't be taken with St. John's wort. Oh, well, that's, yeah. The supplement shouldn't be taken with St. John's wort. But if you can produce it in your system, it's not a problem. Oh. Yeah, you're unlikely to produce that much. We're going to give people extra in the study trying to do it. And again, I wouldn't recommend that everybody in this room runs out and buys some SAMI. I think it'd be much better if you only consider it if you are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Yes? Now, are there other nutritional pathways to increasing the level or does it have to be taken as an external supplement? I think that for normal people, the question is, can you make enough in your body? Well, can you ingest enough? Yeah. yeah, you can make enough in your body. And it has been found that production is lower when you get older, too. So it's your decision. Uh, whether you want to supplement or not, but I'd, I'd wait until there's some reason to do so. Okay, now we're going to talk about advanced glycation end products, but we have a question before. Yes? Yeah, why would you uh, restrict to uh, the with the diagnosis Why would you wait to take SAMe? Yeah. Oh, no special reason, extra pill, extra expense, and you're probably making enough if you're getting enough of the two B vitamins. Um, you know, many people take it for osteoarthritis at a younger age and for depression, as widely used in Europe, especially for depression. Um, yeah, it's non-patentable, so it's not so profitable as a, as a drug. So these are the foods that have advanced glycation end products, and they have them because of browning. 
The browning forms a Maillard reaction, and when these foods are brown, because they don't contain water, which would interrupt the process of becoming advanced glycation end products, when they're browned, they form these plasticized proteins. Which foods have the most? Well, here's a chart. Chicken, bacon, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, turkey, chicken. You get the idea. From top to bottom on the list. So these are the foods that have the most of these advanced glycation end products. The acronym is AGE. And they're very much involved in aging. If Alzheimer's disease and you know, destroyed kidneys and arteries don't convince you, what about wrinkles? Because they also cause wrinkles in the face. And um, that's not so good either. So what can we do about it? Well, we can avoid forming them in our blood. Now, a very good test for diabetes is the uh, hemoglobin H1C test. And this test tests for glycated hemoglobin. When you have too much sugar in your blood, you're glycating your own blood and blood vessels, causing advanced glycation end products, which in diabetes are the chief cause of damage to the kidneys, destruction of the kidneys, destruction of the arteries, blindness, amputation, all that. So they don't have a good track record in diabetes. And they have about the same track record in destroying the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So the two sources. If you get excess sugars in the blood, then you produce them yourself, especially if you can't eliminate that. Now, I just read an alarming statistic. Half of Americans over 20 have either prediabetes or diabetes. So in these people, blood glucose levels will be higher, and they'll be making inside their bodies these advanced glycation end products, which will go on to destroy well, there are blood vessels and nerves. This study um, in the free radical biology and medicine looks at the, well, basically what they're saying in science speak is AGEs cause Alzheimer's. But because scientists don't use the cause word, they're saying AGE formation represents an early, if not initial, event in disease progression. But if you kind of block out the nouns and verbs, you get it's a big problem with Alzheimer's disease. But you can avoid them. Don't get huge sugar rushes and stay away from barbecued, broiled, or fried meat and also aged cheeses. And that's what we're doing on our study. We're having people stay away from these cooking methods. And if they want dairy products, they're going to have to go with you know, yogurt or cottage cheese. And of course, it's probably going to have to be the skim variety because of the saturated fat because we're keeping those down, too. Yes? On the note of the saturated fat, I've also heard studies coconut oil reduce Alzheimer's disease. Oh, boy. Well, I guess it's time to talk about coconut oil. We've all heard this one. Uh, yes, a few years ago, a preemie doctor had a problem with her husband. He couldn't draw a clock. Now, we use a two- to three-hour test called Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive Branch, administered by neuropsychologists, along with MRI and CAT scans in order to determine if there's Alzheimer's disease. But she just had him drawing a clock, that's all. He was never diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she gave him two tablespoons of coconut oil a day, and he could draw a clock. <laughs> wow, really impressive science. Uh, I usually look at the numbers in a study to see how many people are included, and I'd like more than one in almost any case. <laughs> Um, and it would be nice to have a placebo group, control group, or something else, too, and, and a diagnosis. That's really important. So, uh, can I say? I have a book on fats and oils. I call it my fat book because it's really fat. It's on fats and oils. This is available on my website for under 10 bucks. If you want to read up all about fats and oils, it's pretty much all about fats and oils. Trans fats, sat fats, all of those things. Now, among saturated fats, there are three saturated fats that clog up your arteries. They're atherogenic. Those three fats are lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid. May as well know the name of the enemy here. They are 12, 14, and 16 carbon saturated fats. They're all identical except for their chain length. These three clog up your arteries. Coconut oil has 25% of palmitic and myristic acid and 40% of lauric acid, totaling 65% atherogenic fatty acids. Double what's in lard or butter, which most people would consider not good for the heart. So the saturated fats in coconut oil are a huge problem. But what makes oils good? What makes a fatty substance good? That would be vitamin E. There's none in coconut oil. 
ALA, the essential omega-3 found in plants, there's none in coconut oil. It's in a lot of other oils, but not coconut oil. Phytosterols, that black cholesterol absorption into the body, thereby lowering blood cholesterol, very low content in coconut oil, about the lowest of any plant. Anything else that's good about an oil, coconut oil doesn't have. I don't understand why anyone would recommend it. We're telling our participants not to take coconut oil because if you took two tablespoons of coconut oil, you couldn't possibly stay below 7% of your calories as saturated fat. Two tablespoons would be more than that if you ate nothing else all day. And there's saturated fat in most foods, little bits here and there. So I, I would consider coconut oil as probably the most damaging of all the oils. And I don't recommend that people eat bottled oils anyway. Better to get your fats and oils from nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, that sort of thing. When they're, I've got a whole chapter on how they're taken out of the nut, bean, or seed, and they strip away the fiber, all of it, and the vitamin E, most of it, and the lecithin, all of it, and they bleach it and deodorize it and heat it and make it rancid and produce about 5% trans fats, even if it's not hydrogenated. Basically, bottled oils should be used with discretion, very small amounts. They're very much like sugar or white flour. They're natural products that have been stripped of most of their nutrients, and what they have left is pure calories. And fats, of course, are very high in calories. They have nine calories per gram, as opposed to four for proteins and carbohydrates. So well, I'm glad we got coconut oil out of the way. Um, there is other subjects on coconut oil, ketosis, uh, microbiology of how they kill off bugs and things. None of them would be relevant to, or helpful with Alzheimer's disease. The contraindications are just too strong. So this study actually is, uh, was reported in the, yes, the Kuwait Medical Journal. I don't know who reads the Kuwait Medical Journal. But this Dr. Stig Benmark is a Norwegian doctor who works at the London School of Medicine. And this summary of... AGEs and their, how they contribute to damage in the body in many different chronic diseases is an excellent review. If you have medical nomenclature, I'd recommend that you read this study. Really relevant. He found that advanced glycation end products were three times as high in Alzheimer's brains as not, and he found them specifically inside the tau tangles and in the amyloid plaque. The AGEs in the amyloid plaque then shower the brain with 50 times the free radical damage that a normal protein would do. So when you eat these foods that have been, you know, animal foods that have been broiled or barbecued or fried brown, what happens is the shorter chain ones of them are able to absorb through the intestines into the bloodstream. And you can double the amount in your bloodstream with a meal high in these AGEs. So then it goes to the blood-brain barrier, which you'd think would just stop them, right? The blood-brain barrier has a very interesting receptor called RAGE. That's an interesting acronym, isn't it, for a brain? Receptor for advanced glycation end products. When an AGE locks onto this receptor, it steps up inflammation in the brain quite a bit. Cytokines are induced, like interleukin nuclear transcription factor and all kinds of of inflammatory components, the glia, the, the brain protectors are stimulated, and basically increasing inflammation in the brain, then they go in, lodge in the amyloid plaques, shower your brain with free radical damage, and those poor little delicate membranes around each brain cell, they have a lot of DHA, you know, docosahexaenoic acid. It's a 22 carbon fatty acid that is very vulnerable, the most vulnerable to oxidation of any fatty acid that's normally found in a body. So that's how they kill off brain cells, the AGEs. Good idea to avoid them. So we're going to reduce them in our diet and because they're just found to be probable causes of the damage to the brain. You'll notice that I use scientific studies on the bottom of each screen, and that's because that's the only place that I get... Well, I have two sources of my information. One are dozens, hundreds, actually thousands of scientific studies that I've read and saved, and the other is my diet doctor software where I analyze diets to see which nutrients are high and low in the diet. But I don't get my information from, you know, coconut oil drugstore in a bottle book or other such popular books because they tend to be very inaccurate and they're pushing a position and squeezing the science to go their way. And I, I'd like to just, you know, my goal is your health and not to squeeze science. Yes.
Uh, what kind of supplement? Oh, DHA supplement. Well, now, because DHA forms maybe half of the fatty acids on brain cell membranes, you would think, well, hey, we'll take more DHA and that will help. A pivotal study came out a few years ago. This study was funded by the major producer of DHA in the country. The two lead authors are patent holders for that company. This was a very well done study, highly financed, you know, the kind of study that I wish I could get funding for. Uh, must have cost them millions of dollars to do this. And they looked at DHA and whether taking that as a supplement would reduce dementia. It did not. And with all of their incentive to make their product look good, I really believe this study. And others have had equivocal reasons too. So actually DHA wouldn't be that bad an idea if you could find non-rancid DHA. Good luck. One study looking at fish oil at the manufacturers they surveyed all the manufacturers, checked for lipid peroxidation. They found 91% of the fish oil was rancid at the factory. Before packaging, labeling, bottling, shipping, sitting in a health food store, going to your house, sitting on your shelf, chances of fish oil or DHA not being rancid, well, it, it would be difficult to find. You can make more DHA in your body by getting enough ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, the basic essential omega-3, and then not so much of the bottled oils, which have too much of the competing LA or linoleic acid. And I've got a whole chapter in my book on fats on how you make that into EPA and DHA. So it can be done in the human body. It is done in the human body. Most of us make most of our DHA and EPA in our bodies. The idea would be to support that process. Then it's not rancid. So there's other issues, too, uh, contamination, chiefly, too, with that one. Oh, yes. Are you asking about algae? Yes. When you take, uh, let's say, flaxseed, which has a lot of alpha linolenic acid, uh, which is an 18 carbon, three times desaturated, the first step is delta 6 desaturase, then elongase, then delta 5 desaturase, you've got EPA. One, two, three. And those are normal processes within each of our bodies. We can encourage them. We cannot. It takes place in the liver. So if you have hep C or diabetes, you may not be able to make it. You may need to supplement. It's a long story. I encourage those of you who are interested, you can get my fat book, read the chapter on that transformation. There are many nutrients necessary for that transformation to take place, coenzymes. And there are some other things, factors that can limit your production. So take a look at that one. Now, in... They looked at diabetics who, where advanced glycation end products are terrible destroyers of their kidneys, and they found by eating the same food but cooking it differently, they could cut them in half. And that's cooking with water or steam rather than dry. And now you can barbecue tofu and vegetables all day long. The water will interrupt the process, and they won't form AGEs even if they brown. So it's, it's really related to products with very low water content. Oh, by the way, there's some spices that can inhibit AGE formation. Cloves, allspice, and cinnamon can inhibit this. So if you just say, okay, I'm not going to stop barbecuing, all right, make some sauce up, put these spices in it, and that might help. Now, inflammation is a huge part of Alzheimer's disease. The inflammation causes more free radical damage in the brain and kills off more brain cells. So there are many anti-inflammatory components, such as quercetin. And quercetin is excellent. It's found in apples, berries, beans, soy, alfalfa sprouts, chick feeds, and peanuts. And then genistein. Well, actually, soy, alfalfa sprouts, and chickpeas have genistein in them. This is a very powerful anti-inflammatory constituent of soybeans and other beans in a lot of other foods. And I was happy to hear Mary Clifton, Dr. Clifton, before me speak about soy and also confirm, as so many other people have, that it's not a problem with the phytoestrogens. They are actually reducing breast cancer and prostate cancer risk, not enlarging it. I have many studies on that. Also, indole-3-carbinol. Now, that comes from the cruciferous vegetables. Who here loves kale, okay? Yo, lots of kale lovers in this crowd. I do, too. Kale is one of those cruciferous vegetables, and it really helps cut inflammation, not only in the brain, in the joints, in the stomach all over your body, in the arteries to help with heart disease. I'm going to give a talk tomorrow on called No More Heart Attacks, 
And so these are important for that too. Whoop, I did a double click, sorry. All right, well, this is getting too serious. I have to tell you a joke. <laughs> so anybody heard of Sarah Palin? You know, she was almost president. Well, Sarah Palin was invited to the White House to dinner. So she got to the White House at this big fancy dinner and sat down next to a distinguished man with a goatee. So she turned to him and said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a psychiatrist. I work with Alzheimer's disease. So she thought about it and she said, well, how do you tell if someone has Alzheimer's disease? He says, well, we ask them a simple question and then if they can't answer it, well, we need more testing. So she got brave and she said, well, try me on one of those questions. <laughs> so the psychiatrist turns to her and says, Captain Cook circumnavigated the world three times. On which of his three circumnavigations did he die? <laughs> okay, well, this crowd got it really fast. Sarah Palin said, I'm not good at history. Do you have another question? <laughs> okay, she's an easy target. What can I say? Okay, so... On a more serious note, we have these free radicals. And uh, each cell in our bodies is attacked by free radicals 10,000 times a day. I've heard estimates of 100,000 times a day. If we don't keep these guys in check, our brains and our entire bodies will just disintegrate. So we have our own antioxidant systems, and we have a lot of antioxidants in the foods we're designed to eat that protect us from the free radicals. Normal metabolism creates free radicals. Actually, if you run or work out, you get more free radicals, so you should eat more antioxidants. Uh, but I still think we should all run and work out. Aging, it's unavoidable. We produce a few more free radicals. However, radiation is avoidable sometimes. I mean, if you really need a CAT scan, which is one of the highest doses of radiation, then you need it and you should get it. But if you, they want to do a duplicate the next day for insurance purposes, then you might want to ask them to use the old one because it is damaging, causes a lot of free radical damage. Fried foods. In fried foods, you have the, um, the oils are damaged and malondialdehyde can form. This causes DNA adducts and cancer. So it's a good idea to avoid fried foods. I know they're tasty, but it's a good idea to avoid them anyway. Chemical pollution is another way you can get free radicals. You can eat organic. Cigarette smoke, I think we all know are bad, but they have a tremendous acceleration of free radical damage in the body. Stress and alcohol are two other ways to increase free radical damage, although alcohol can sometimes reduce stress, thus lowering the free radical damage. So you have to figure that one out. So here are some of the plant-based antioxidants. Beta carotene, in fact, all of the carotenoids are excellent and they look just like that picture. Colorful carotenoids. If your food is a rainbow of color, that's a good hint that you're eating the right foods to protect yourself. They are fat-based, and they're fat-based antioxidants, so they can protect brain cell membranes, and this is very important. Then there's vitamin E, which is a long story, and I'll talk more about vitamin E, and vitamin C. These are the antioxidants in food, along with plant polyphenols. There are many excellent plant polyphenols that are antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, and those are also found in the colorful, usually the dark-colored berries, a good source of those. They help prevent dementia. Now, vitamin E, I have sunflower seeds here because they're the richest source of alpha tocopherol. Vitamin E has four tocopherols, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And you don't want to just have the alpha tocopherol, but you want all of the tocopherols. Oops. I think I dropped my clicker. Here it is. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. Uh, well, maybe I will jump ahead. Uh, in this study, they used the wrong form of vitamin E. They used a synthetic alpha tocopherol. And that's not only just alpha tocopherol, but seven-eighths of it are the wrong isomers that are unreal. They don't work in the body. So these little guards that are implanted into our LDL as they circulate in our bloodstream to protect them, and if they can be protected from oxidation, then they just dock onto cells and supply them with cholesterol and triglycerides and other good things. But if they're oxidized, they do not. So the vitamin E is implanted into the LDL, protecting them on their journey through our bloodstream, what if it's fake alpha-tocopherol? No protection. 
It's, it's like a security guard with a plastic gun and no bullets. But it's cheap. So all the vitamin manufacturers use synthetic alpha-tocopherol. About 99% of the supplements have just that. And in this study, they used it. But they used 2,000 IUs, double the upper limit, and it really helped. In this study by Sano, the original study, they, uh, they looked at vitamin E, and it stopped people from going into the hospital or dying or into full care homes 35% less than people who didn't take the vitamin E. So even the wrong form can be helpful. But the right form in lots of studies have been shown in this one, lower disease risk by 67%. That's pretty nice. Another study, the beta-tocopherol form and the gamma-tocopherol form are the ones that are most protective. So in our study, we're giving people sunflower seeds for the alpha-tocopherol and walnuts for the gamma-tocopherol. And the gamma-tocopherol is very rich in walnut, so we're just giving an ounce of each powder to these elders. And, of course, you could eat a little bit more, but that's a minimum. We're also giving them a supplement, the, the brain and body food, with the real vitamin E that is all of the tocopherols and natural, no synthetic. So that's how we're doing that. Um, another study confirming that the mixed tocopherols are very helpful for Alzheimer's disease. There's really no doubt about it. Now, I did mention that common supplements aren't helpful, so I'll go on. Vitamin E in food. Sunflower seeds have a tremendous amount. Now, you can get all your vitamin E from butter, but you need to eat 30 servings a day. And that might be a bit much. Um, but you notice that cheddar cheese, yogurt, T-bone steaks, boiled chicken, salmon, none of these have vitamin E in them, but they have lots of fat that needs protection. So I guess if you were going to want to eat one of these foods, my wife's creamy walnut dressing, which is in her, sorry, Healthy Recipes for Friends book, she has a creamy walnut dressing that if you pour that over, then you'll get some vitamin E protection along with your meat if you really insist on eating it. These are great vitamin E sources here, hazelnuts, walnuts, sunflower seeds, and almonds. Now, too much is too much, and too little is too little. So a handful a day might be a good idea to keep you healthy. Vitamin C has been shown to help, too. In this study, vitamin C was associated with a higher score on the mini mental status exam. So people who had higher vitamin C in their blood because they ate more fruits and vegetables actually were smarter. The dementia group were three times more likely to have low vitamin C levels. Put them both together. That's the way to do it. Vitamin E is implanted in your brain cell membrane, protecting it. It detects a free radical, it pulls it up to the surface and neutralizes it. Great. It's out of bullets. How does it get recharged? Vitamin C comes along and recharges it. Then it can go and neutralize another free radical over and over and over again. So any study done without vitamin C to back up the vitamin E, it's not going to work. Honolulu Aging Study found that they could cut down to one-eighth the risk of dementia. Not specifically Alzheimer's, they just looked at overall dementia. But one-eighth the risk is a huge effect just to get enough vitamin C and E both. Fruits and vegetables for vitamin C, it's really simple. The only other thing I know of is potatoes have vitamin C, and they're not quite a vegetable. Now, vitamin E is deficient in all these diets. Every single diet except for a whole food plant-based diet or a raw food plant-based diet. That's because these people are eating, us people are eating nuts and seeds. And that's where the vitamin E comes from. Vitamin C is found adequately in a lot of diets, but not some like the Atkins diet. That's what I use to check for nutrition. And why guess if you're getting enough of these crucial nutrients? Or why guess that you're getting the right amount of saturated fat when you can measure it and it just reads it out, you know, 7%, 10%. If you're on the Atkins diet, the saturated fat might read out 28%, four times the maximum level. So plant polyphenols. Now, there was a study that was just done. Is this the one? This is one that showed that grape juice, berries, and walnuts help with Alzheimer's disease. Already they're putting together a few of the things that we're using in our study. This one is a nurse's health study spinoff. They looked at this vast study over 21 years. The nurses who ate one cup of berries a day delayed their dementia by two years. Now, this is very significant. If we could delay dementia by five years, we could cut Alzheimer's in half. 
If we can delay dementia by 10 years, that's it. Alzheimer's epidemic over. And I'm looking for our study to actually do that, to cut Alzheimer's disease, push it back by 10 years. We'll tell you in, I'll tell you in a year how it's going. Grape juice improves memory. If the people in our study, the participants can't get berries, a cup of berries, blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes every day, then they can have some reserve grape juice to take on the days they can't, and we're going to ask them to dilute it so the sugars don't absorb too fast. Now, we're also going to supply the minerals necessary for the internal antioxidants. So superoxide dismutase needs these three minerals, zinc, copper, and manganese, and selenium is necessary for glutathione peroxidase, which turns hydrogen peroxide into water. Very good stuff. The mitochondria is the energy factory in our bodies that produces energy. It has a membrane that's delicate too, and it needs to be protected. The energy factories die, then you get poor nerve transmission in the brain and you can't think as well, and then the cells die from lack of energy too. So we want to protect that. So again, manganese is essential. You may not be able to pronounce it, but it's essential for your health. Now, coenzyme Q10, I mentioned, is the only fat-soluble antioxidant that we make in our bodies. So we're going to supplement that. It's been found that it's very important in preventing Alzheimer's disease. Separate studies have shown this. I gave a talk at Harvard Psychiatric Teaching Facility, McLean Hospital, uh, two years ago, and they already had two studies running with coenzyme Q10 against Alzheimer's. But we're incorporating that along with all the other things and there's no good reason not to take coenzyme Q10 at any age. And if you're on statins, it's, you're probably taking it already because they lower the production of CoQ10 by about 40%. In this study, suggests that CoQ10 would be potentially a useful drug for Alzheimer's disease. Funny they use the word drug for uh, something that we make in our bodies. But we might not make as much as we get older. So it might be a good idea to supplement that. There's no downside to it. Now, by lowering cholesterol, we can quench the genes that make the secretase enzymes that make the amyloid plaque. So lowering cholesterol is good. How do you do it? Well, it's simple. You lower your animal food intake and raise your plant food intake, and your cholesterol goes down, and you have more antioxidants, less oxidized LDL. Really pretty simple. Um, in this study, animal products doubled the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Also, the red meat has heme iron, which may cause the damage from iron to exist in the brain. Now, this is an interesting Swedish study. They looked at, they followed people from midlife to old age. Those with lower cholesterol at midlife had one-third the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease as those with high blood cholesterol at midlife. So it has a huge effect on Alzheimer's disease. That's why we're lowering the saturated fat, which will quickly get cholesterol down if the people will just do it which we'll see. Um, yeah, I think I pretty much said this. Lowering cholesterol helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. And you do that by lowering sat fats. And outside of coconut oil, sat fats are an animal fat. I want to talk about a couple of favorite plants before I end. The gold standard for medical research is double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. Nine of these all showed that ginkgo biloba helped both in delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease and in reversing it. That's pretty good. So we're including ginkgo biloba in our study. It, what it does is it thins blood so that that blood can get to the tiny capillaries in the brain and help you think. So we're going to have to exclude people on blood thinners. And if you're on blood thinners, you should not take ginkgo biloba. You have to take one of the other plants that's going to be helpful. Now, I'm only going to introduce two plants today. I do have a database of worldwide medical plant usage that covers over 1,300 natural remedies from 54 countries and regions, has 168,000 footnotes, and hundreds of plants used for dementia. I'm just going to list the top two today. One more study on ginkgo biloba, the drug that everyone we see in the clinic with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, they're all on donopezil because it's the only drug, well, there's one other, but it's the first drug that is given to people with memory problems, although it doesn't stop the degeneration of the brain at all, not for a minute. It has terrible side effects, causes nausea, terrible restlessness. It's actually 
made in the same exact way that the organophosphate pesticides are made. In fact, it is an organophosphate pesticide, like malathion. But they use smaller amounts, which encourages nerves to overfire. So they should fire once, but instead they, they cause your nerves to fire over and over again. Anyway, this study showed that ginkgo biloba worked just as well as this drug, but without any bad side effects. So one more, go to cola. It's the last plant I'll talk about. They found that it lowered amyloid plaque in the hippocampus, a memory area of the brain. That's exactly what we'd like to do. It's an antioxidant. It reduces the peroxidation of the lipids in the brain cells, and it even protects DNA against damage. Tremendous stuff. Gotocol has been used in Ayurvedic medicine for thousands of years, and the modern science on it, this six-month study showed that people, instead of getting worse, got better on their scores of memory. So we're including Gotocol in our study, too. The last one shows that Gotocol does have some, well, let's see, is that the next one? Um, no. This one shows age-related decline in cognitive function in healthy middle-aged people. So if you're still healthy, go to cola will still help your brain. Uh, I want to mention that aerobic exercise will help with vascular dementia, but not with Alzheimer's disease. But since vascular dementia is so common, exercise is a great idea. I talked about DHA earlier in response to a question. DHA really is not going to help um, with dementia. It's been pretty well proven that it's, it's not something that we're including in our study for a couple reasons, rancidity being the main one. And then environmental toxins really increase the risk. Solvents, magnetic fields, smoking, mercury, lead, pesticides. I think we're all trying to avoid these things anyway. Does aluminum increase the risk of dementia? I have four excellent studies that show that aluminum does not increase the risk of dementia. And everyone is funded by Reynolds. <laughs> it's true. Um, these three excellent studies show that aluminum forms neurofibrillary plaques, the tangles that are not exactly like the ones in Alzheimer's disease, but just as damaging to the nerve cells. Good idea to avoid aluminum. Common route of exposure is underarm antiperspirant sprays that contain aluminum and can absorb through the sinuses. So wrapping this talk up, and I know it's a bit of a whirlwind talk, but I have all these things to tell you. Um, folate and vitamin B12 can cut your risk in half. Dietary vitamin E can knock it down to half. Vitamin E with vitamin C can knock it down to an eighth. So if all you did was get vitamin C, vitamin E, and two B vitamins, you can knock it down to 1 32nd of the chances that you would have without these advantages. Simple nutrients, easy to get. Grape juice and berries. Now, I recommend a cup of berries to everybody because they're delicious and good in so many ways and very available. You can consider coenzyme Q10 and supplemental SAMe if you're having memory problems. Uh, there's really no bad side effects as long as you're not on SSRI drugs. There's four minerals that support the endogenous antioxidants. Now, for extra points, who can name any of these four minerals? Zinc? Copper? Selenium. My wife knows all of them. <laughs> and manganese, the hard one to pronounce. These are essential minerals that we're putting in the brain and body food so that people don't miss one of these. Also, ginkgo biloba and go to cola we're putting in. Now, I have little bombshell bullets at the bottom here. AGEs, advanced glycation end products, two to three times higher. You could reduce your risk greatly of damage from many sources by lowering those. Animal fat and blood cholesterol increase your risk. So I hope I've given you a good idea of what we plan to do in our Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial. And this is my coat uh, from Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience where I work and work on this trial. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And he can talk to you individually, maybe back here. Oh, over um, here, that's right. But for right now, I would just like to uh, take a look. Hi, babe, do you have any water? I see it.
public group for funding this implementation? Life Extension, Life Extension Foundation. Very famous group. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They're donating it. Yes. No strings. Which is the one that has... You said don't take notes because I've got it in a book. Which is the best one? 20 bucks. Okay. Thank you. It's the same e-supplement vegetarian or... Yes, vegetarian supplement. Yeah, these are totally vegetarian. Okay. And how much a ginkgo biloba or gotukula one need to take? Well, we're using the standardized extract. Thank you so much. Yeah. Enjoy. We're using the standardized extract of the ginkgo biloba. So you want to make sure it's a standardized extract and then read the label and see, because they vary in concentration. It'll say how many per day. And same, how many? We're Please don't go over to Dr. Blake right now. We want to get this over. And membership today is $5. So we want to get you $5. Okay. Um, the Certificate of Honor presented to the San Francisco Vegetarian Society, 15th Annual World Veg Festival, October 11th, 12th, 2012. Whereas on behalf of the city and county of San Francisco, I am pleased to recognize and honor San Francisco Vegetarian Society on the occasion of the 15th Annual World Vegetarian Festival. I commend the dedicated volunteers of the San Francisco Vegetarian Society for their commitment to providing information on the health, environmental, and humane benefits of a plant-based diet. Their efforts promoting healthy lifestyles for our residents represent San Francisco values at their best. Congratulations on another successful festival and continuing this 15-year tradition in our city. Best wishes for many more to come and success in all your future endeavors. Therefore, I have herewith set my hand and paws the seal of the city and county of San Francisco to be affixed. Edwin Henry. Amen. Now all we need now is for him to become a vegan, right? And not just support. Now I want to introduce Greg. And he's going to give the rest of it. It's a really, uh, really great event. And uh, it's so much work to put on. And Dixie, she gets all the credit for organizing this. I don't know how she does it, but she stays up very late to do it. So let's give my hand to Dixie. At 80. Whoa. It's supposed to be retired. <laughs> you can't stop. You can't stop that moment. Oh, vacations. I don't have any. <laughs> it's amazing. It really is. It's very inspiring for a young guy like me to see this and to think, wow, there is a reason why I'm, I'm vegan is because she doesn't even see a doctor, and I think that's amazing. We we have the raffles up here. We're going to do the raffle, but I'm just wondering how many people in here bought a raffle ticket? Okay, okay, fair number. All right. I was afraid that a lot of people probably are next door seeing Cowspiracy, but you know what? You have to be present to win, so you guys have a better chance to win. Uh, can I get a couple volunteers to help draw?